Good morning and welcome to the online service for Soundside Church. My name's Jim. I'm one of the pastors here at Soundside and we're so glad you've joined us. If you are a very first time visitor to our online service, we are grateful that you have joined us. And if you'd like more information, you can check us out at soundsidechurch.com. For those of you that are regular members and attendees, thank you for being with us this morning. We hope that our online option is a great blessing to you. We want you to sing along, read along with the scripture reading, and then we're looking forward to the next part of Pastor Aaron's Revelation series. Don't forget, if you're able to, we would love to see you today at 1 p.m. at the Center at North Point, where we continue our outdoor services. Next week, our plan is to transition to a 10 a.m. service, same location, different time. There will still be online options for those that are not yet feeling comfortable or able to come to those services. Either way, we are so grateful that you have chosen to put time and energy into being with us this morning or in our later afternoon service so that we can praise God together. So let's do that. this water I won't go under I won't drown and when I'm in over my head I know that you won't let me down and when I'm broken and down to nothing I know that you are always up to something good Believe me, your love surrounds me, I won't fear. And when I'm broken, down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. I know that you are always up to something good. darkest night you are on my side you are always faithful through my fear and doubt you will lead me out you are always able through the darkest night you are on my side you are always faithful through my fear and doubt you will lead me out you are always able Yes, we know I know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good There's nothing your love won't endure. I know that you are always up to 
something good What love could remember No wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What Patience would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the when you hear the word Armageddon. Destruction, war, nuclear holocaust, the end of the world as we know it. Well, in our text for today, Revelation chapter 16, we're going to be looking at what the Bible has to say about Armageddon. But before we do, yep, you're right. I got new glasses this week. Thanks for noticing. And uh, when it comes to new glasses, I, you know, the old ones I've had for like five years or something, and the lenses had gotten scratched and smudged, and just it wasn't as clear as, as well, new glasses are. But as for probably most of you who wear corrective lenses, uh, when I put these glasses on, it's really, really important that each lens does a different job. My right eye has certain needs and my left eye has certain needs and so I need the two lenses to do something a little bit differently so that I can see things clearer. And in Revelation chapter 16 today, we are going to find two lenses through which we are going to view this teaching about a thing called Armageddon. Now, like most parts of Revelation, Revelation 16 does contain quite a bit of judgment. And we've been talking about that along uh, along the way. But 
I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those judgments here today, mainly because everything that is said in Revelation chapter 16, with a few exceptions, has already been said or hinted at earlier in the book of Revelation. Instead, we are going to spend our time dealing with these two lenses. But there are a few things in Revelation 16 that we do need to deal with. So, for instance, last week, Revelation 15, we talked about the seven last plagues. And we talked about how those are kind of making us think back to the book of Exodus, where God poured out plagues on the land of Egypt to release his people and deliver them from slavery. And the focus of our time in Revelation here between chapter 6 and 16 has been on God delivering his people from evil. And chapter 16 is no exception to that. So, let's dive in. We begin with plagues 1, 2, and 3. These plagues are the wrath of God, and they are figuratively contained in bowls that are given to angels, and those angels pour out the bowls onto the earth. Plague number one, the angel pours out his bowl, and these horrible, painful sores uh, fester up on the bodies of those who have taken the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. And we've said a lot about that in previous chapters. The second plague, plague number two, turns all of the salt water, the entire ocean, to blood. Plague number three turns all the fresh water to blood. And this is where we find our first lens through which to view all of this judgment. And we find it in verse five. Here's what it says. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The message of these verses is one of retribution. Revenge, actually, if you will. And that seems difficult for us to hear. But the thing that we've got to remember is that as the end draws near, life will become more difficult for those who follow Jesus. Even here in our beloved United States of America, things will get more difficult for the church. All nations tend away from God. And the closer we get to the end, the more we will recognize that this earth is not our home. It is not a friend to the righteous. And as I've said, it will become more difficult for those who follow Jesus. And what we need to hear, what the first century church needed to hear, and what we hear uh, today need to hear, and what we're definitely going to need to hear in the future is, God is going to do something about it. God will bring judgment upon his enemies and ours, which leaves us in a very, very interesting position because we think about this attitude and it feels wrong. I mean, didn't Jesus pray for his enemies when he was on the cross? Luke chapter 23, verse 33 says, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then Stephen, the first Christian martyr, even as he was, even as he was dying under the stones of his, his murderers, he prayed. In Acts chapter 7, verses 59 and 60, he said this, And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And we too are called to have this attitude as Romans chapter 12 and uh, verse 17 says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So yes, an attitude of forgiveness is Christian. But one of the pictures that Revelation draws for us is to help us understand that the world will come to the point where it no longer tolerates the followers of Christ. It no longer tolerates the church. And we need to recognize that that's where this all is headed at some point in the future. Because for one reason or another, this world will find a way and find a reason to push the followers of Christ to the margins and off the cliff if necessary. And that's why we read here in verse 7 of Revelation 16 that the altar is crying out, Yes, Lord! Yes, your judgments are right! Because that is the very altar that we read about in Revelation 6. That altar, when the fifth seal was opened and John saw the souls of all those who had been killed in the name of Jesus, and they were crying out, How long, O Lord, until you avenge our blood? This, this is the answer. Next up, plagues four and five. Listen as I read Revelation chapter 16, verse eight. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds." John's point here as he describes these judgments is that the people falling under the judgment of God do not repent of their sins. To the contrary, they curse God. God has been revealing these judgments throughout the book of Revelation and the result has not been, you know what, God, you're right. I'm going to turn my life over to you. It has been the hardening of hearts and the result is utter cursing of God. Now, I don't want us to get the wrong idea as if these people suddenly look God in the eyes and curse him. That may be what happens. In fact, I have no doubt that that will happen. But as I listen to the world around me even now, I think I can already hear them cursing. And the surprising thing is, I hear people cursing God who don't even believe in God. Even now, every tragedy, every atrocity in this world is laid at the feet of God. Have a conversation with somebody who rejects God, and what do we hear? If there were a God who would allow this, if there were a God who would do this, I would never worship that God. I would hate a God who could run the universe in this way. Well, they don't believe in him at all, and yet they hate him. That's the picture that John gives to us as the result of what God does in the future and even now in the present. As I said, it may be future, and Revelation does depict the future, but it's present with us even now. I, I read in that fourth or that fifth judgment, that fifth bowl, where darkness is poured upon the throne of the beast, and of course, this would refer to that, you know, that 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 global government, that that government figure, and the way that the world is being run, and darkness comes on it. And if we're paying attention, we paid attention last Sunday. We realized that. This is referencing one of the plagues on Egypt back in the book of Exodus. But I wonder, I wonder if this is a physical darkness like it was back in the book of Exodus, or if this is more of a psychological or spiritual darkness, a confusion that falls upon all people. And did you notice one of the results that the people had? They gnawed their tongues for pain. And once again, I'm left wondering, are we really talking about people just sitting there chewing their tongues? Or is there something else to this? Are we maybe talking about people chewing on their words as they attempt to endure mass confusion that spreads across the world? I don't know. But I do know that when people try to make sense of confusion. There's a lot of words that get chewed on, and there's a lot of hopelessness, and there's a lot of darkness. I mean, who knows? Maybe I spend too much time on Twitter, but I certainly see plenty of that here. Now we come to the sixth and the seventh plagues.
The seventh plague is the total, utter, and final destruction of the beast and his empire. And, and that's going to be described in much greater detail in chapters 17, 18, and 19, which we will, Lord willing, get into later in the fall in part three of Revelation, Thy Kingdom Come. But the sixth plague gives us the preparation for that. It also gives us our second lens, which we'll look through in just a moment. But what happens here in this sixth plague is the Euphrates River is dried up to make way for the kings from the east. Now, we've talked about this earlier in Revelation, how the Euphrates River, real river, you can find it today, represented the eastern border of the Roman Empire for the Apostle John and his first century readers. It was a natural barrier that helped to protect them from the Parthians, a fearsome people that the Romans were afraid of. And now it's being dried up so the kings from the east, maybe it's the Parthians, maybe it's people that we would recognize on the national scene today, they're able to make their way into the Roman Empire, and I don't think they're coming for dinner. No, this is a hostile force that is coming in. And those types of things are described in other places in the Bible. So, for, for instance, I think in Daniel chapter 11. But something else happens. We see some frogs. Kind of weird, but they're frogs. One frog comes out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan. Another frog comes out of the mouth of the beast, that's that government figure. And then another frog comes out of the mouth of the false prophet, uh, who was the religious figure that got people to worship and follow the beast. These frogs are demons that go around the world to gather all the nations of the world for something really, really important that the Bible calls the battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And all the nations are gathered together for battle. And where are they gathered? A place that in the Hebrew language is called Armageddon. What is Armageddon? Well, short answer is, it's a mountain that doesn't exist. Um, let me see if I can explain. Armageddon, John was very specific to say it's called that in the Hebrew language. And in the Hebrew language, it is more accurately har Megiddo, which means the Mount of Megiddo. Problem is, there is no Mount of Megiddo. Megiddo is a town, a city, in the Valley of Jezreel in Israel. You can actually go, you can find Megiddo on a map of modern-day Israel. It is in a valley. There are some mountains. There's a mountain near it. Maybe that's what's being referred to, the, the, the mountain behind the town. Or maybe there's a mountain near it, uh, Mount Carmel, perhaps. Maybe that's being referred to as the Mount of Megiddo. Um, I think, perhaps, that there is a spiritual significance to this, although uh, there's certainly room for discussion on it. Megiddo was, like as I said, the valley near the Valley of Jezreel. And the Valley of Jezreel held a very interesting point of significance in the life of Israel. In fact, we find it mentioned several times in the Old Testament. The interesting thing is it's not usually mentioned as if it is some great prophetic place. Uh, but it is the site in Judges chapter 4 and chapter 5, it is the site where the enemies of God were gathered to destroy the people of God and God intervened miraculously to deliver his own people and defeat his enemies. And that perhaps could be the significance of that place. It is mentioned again later on in Zechariah chapter 12 in another context where God's enemies are gathered to destroy God's people and God miraculously comes and intervenes. That also could be uh, the context that's being referenced. Another passage, Daniel chapter 11, doesn't mention Megiddo, um, but it may hint at that region, that area, at again another time when the enemies of God are persecuting the people of God and God intervenes in a miraculous way. And if we're paying attention, I think that's what's being driven at. At some point in the future, according to Revelation, the nations of the world will be gathered to destroy the church of God. But did you catch the second lens in verse 15? In the middle of all this, before we get the name Armageddon, here's what we hear Jesus say. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. I really don't like thieves. 
Uh, I'm assuming you don't either, but uh, for those of us who have had the unfortunate experience of having our homes broken into and things stolen, uh, which sadly we did back in 2013, um, having a thief come, that's kind of a big deal. And uh, although it has been said that a lock is only good for honest men, um, we still take precautions, don't we? Especially at night. I mean, you know, we can see a couple things here and here and, you know, motion sensor lights and um, other things that we use to secure our house and our belongings and our loved ones. But the point is, if we think that there is any chance of a thief coming, we take precautions. So why would Jesus say, in the middle of all this, he's pouring out judgments on the world, and in the middle of it, he interrupts. He says, all right, all the nations are being gathered to that battle of the great day of God Almighty. Oh yeah, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeps his garments on so that he's not woken up naked and exposed. You know, I, I, I don't know how most people sleep, but typically, you know, you, you wear something different to bed than you wear when you, you know, get up and face people. Um, but the idea is you ought to be dressed and ready, not waiting for somebody to bust down the door. Now, again, why would he talk like that? Because Jesus has always been talking like this. He talked this way in Matthew chapter 24, describing to his disciples, nobody knows when I'm coming back, you need to be ready. If the master of the house knew when the thief was coming, he would have been awake to defend himself. Um, that's the point. And then he said it again, um, probably the same place, Luke chapter 23. And then the apostle Paul picks up on that imagery and he says it in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says it... Um, over in Romans chapter 13, and then Peter says it in 2 Peter chapter 3. What's the point? The point is that as we're watching all of this unfold in the book of Revelation, and as we're looking out at the world around us, we need to be ready for Jesus to come back. We need to have the attitude that Paul described in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And then later in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're paying attention to what Revelation has been telling us, Jesus will be returning when it appears that all is lost. And when there is no hope, he's going to come back when he is least expected. And what he says in the middle of Revelation 16 is, he says, be expecting me. I'm coming back. Don't let me catch you by surprise. Be expecting me. And Paul said, we ought to be loving the day of his appearing. And we ought to be looking forward to our Savior's return, which he calls our blessed hope. And so these are the two lenses through which we should be reading Revelation, especially the, uh, the chapter 16 and what happens there. The lens of retribution, that's part of what's going on. And the lens of readiness. Church, the point of this message, of this book, is not to excite you with lurid depictions of destruction, but to encourage you that when you are struggling, when your faith is crippled, when hope begins to wane, that we can rest knowing that Jesus is is returning and we should be ready for the day of his return ready to meet him listen let these words wash over you i'm going to read first thessalonians 5 1 through 11 to help prepare us let these words sink in deep here's what it says now concerning the times and the seasons brothers you have no need to have anything written to you for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the lord will come like a thief in the night while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. 
For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We're not supposed to be looking for signs as if there's some checklist that needs to be, you know, filled in. We're supposed to be looking for Jesus' return and to be ready to receive him when he comes. So the question to you, church, today is this. Are you ready? And if you're not part of a church, same question. Are you ready? Have you taken Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you given your heart to Jesus? The scriptures are clear. He died on a cross to take the punishment for our sin. He rose again from the grave. Forgiveness and eternal life are being offered for those who will repent of their sins and give their lives to Christ. Are you ready to see him when he comes? He's coming for his people. Are you one of his people? Is there somebody you know that you need to tell about the grace and the gift of salvation that Jesus offers? Are you ready? That is, are you saved? Are you ready? Have you bared a... Are you ready? Have you given witness to Jesus? Is there somebody who needs to hear about Jesus from you? Are you ready? Have you surrendered to God's calling on your life? It is a beautiful thing when a person recognizes that God is calling them to some particular path, some particular ministry, understanding why God has put them in a certain time and place, and they have surrendered to that calling that God has placed on their life, where they've said, yes, Lord, my life is yours. Maybe it's to ministry. Maybe it's to missions. Maybe it's recognizing your particular place in whatever field God has placed you. Is there a calling God has placed upon you that you need to surrender to and you say, I better surrender to Jesus before he comes. I want to be ready, having said yes to him. And finally, church, are you ready? Is there some sin in your life, some sinful pattern, some sinful thoughts, some sinful deeds that you have yet to confess to God and forsake, that you have yet to say, God, this is my sin. I confess it to you. I seek your forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Give me strength to live holy for you. Are you ready to see him? Because church, What we read in Revelation, part of it is God's retribution on those who would hurt you for your faith. And part of it is to say, church, get your eyes off the newspaper and get your eyes on the clouds. Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your words. And I pray you would encourage our hearts. May we be ready to see you on the day of your return. In Jesus' name, amen. 